Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. So if you're coming in, but that's fine. Um, the the I want to say the bulletin. That's the second part of what I was going to say. The announcements are very brief. Uh, so you take a look at the bulletin. It's some basically routine the routine announcements. So I'm not gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna spare you just a, a, a discussion of that. If you just want to take a look at what's in the uh, bulletin, you'll see what's uh, out there for announcements. Um, so having said that, we can just uh, prepare ourselves for worship. It's a, it's a beautiful day. Um, this is a, a really neat way that we get ready to transition to spring. I think tomorrow is the first day of spring. Yeah. I'm looking for thank you. I was looking I was looking kind of for an affirmation out there. <laughs> doesn't feel like that. Yes. No, well that well it may not feel like it exactly considering this negative, but you know, looking outside seems there's a sunny sun and everything. It's, a wonderful time, and uh, we do look forward to that. And it's it's the Sabbath day. It's a wonderful time to be right here, ready to start worship. So, with that in mind, uh, let's consider our meditation passage. Our meditation passage this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter twelve, verses twenty-five and twenty-six. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Meditate on that. Let's prepare to worship our God. Please rise now. Please rise and hear the call to worship. This morning our God calls us to worship Him from Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer to our God. God Almighty, you are the only one who is worthy of worship. I pray this morning as we come to you in the righteousness of the one sacrificed on our behalf, in Christ, your only begotten Son. I pray that you would be pleased to receive worship, honor, and praise. You alone are worthy of worship and honor and praise. And we pray that you would be pleased to say to your dear son, in his name, amen. Please join me in the doxology number 731. <laughs>
से sinners in need of grace. For our profession of sin, I'll be using a, a paraphrase of the Ten Commandments. God has commanded that we have no other gods before him. But we have failed to love him. God has commanded that we not make any idols. We have failed to worship him as his word demands. God has commanded that we not take the name of the Lord in vain. We have failed to use his name with holy reverence. God has commanded that we remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. We have failed to holy keep the Sabbath. God has commanded that we honor our father and our mother. But we have failed to give honor to whom it is due. God has commanded that we not murder. But we have failed to love life. God has commanded that we not commit adultery. But we have failed to love faithfulness. God has commanded that we not steal. But we have failed to love generosity. God has commanded that we not bear that we not bear false witness against our neighbor. But we have failed to love the truth. God has commanded that we not cover anything that belongs to our neighbor. But we have failed to be content and thankful stewards of all that he has given. Forgive us, we pray, for the sake of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. sinners in need of grace, for we have given to us an infinitely abundant grace through Jesus Christ. So receive this promise of forgiveness from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Amen. Please rise. Let's sing celebrating the forgiveness that we have. Hymn number 500, Rock of Ages.
Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, we read, Do not lay up for yourself, for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Our true riches are with the Lord, and all the material things that we have are actually His. Yes, so that we give back to him. We give back to him a tenth so that his structure can be maintained, so that our pastor's salary can be paid, so that the work of this church, um, in, a, in a tangible sense, can go forth. That the, the work of this church, in a spiritual sense, goes forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. Your faithful giving to this church um, sustains that work. And we are grateful for it. Um, if there's a boss and employer, you may uh, place uh, your tithes and offerings, or if you give it online, you may continue to do that. And we do thank you for your faithful giving. <laughs> now, privilege to come before our God in prayer. And it truly is a privilege knowing that our God hears our prayers and he is faithful to answer. So we come boldly in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we confess our sins, acknowledge that we are sinners. And acknowledging the grace that uh, covers that. We come to our God boldly with our acknowledgement that he is our God, that he is the holy God. Looking up to him. Our concerns. Um, at the conclusion of, uh, of the prayer time, when I lift up uh, particular needs, with one voice, this congregation will lift up a prayer using the prayer that we were taught through the scriptures, the Lord's Prayer. I'll indicate the appropriate time for us to join with one voice to our God. And now let's bow. Oh God Almighty, you are our God. And you have called us as your people, and you have made us your own through your Son. It's with the power of your Holy Spirit. You sustain us, you guide us, and comfort us. We thank you that you are with us always. To all the challenges that we face in this sinful world. And we look forward to that time, on that last day, when we are lifted up from this place, and our bodies are changed in an instant, and we see you with our eyes, our Lord, we rejoice united forever.
both in spirit and in body. God Almighty, we thank you that, re that for reasons beyond our understanding, you look down upon a sinful people and call them your own. You show them mercy here. It's incredible the mercy that we must strive anyway. death to gain life by putting that sentence on your own begotten son. And that you saw fit to extend that life to the covenant to your people. We thank you that you have sustained us. Now we can say generation to generation in this particular church. We thank you for pouring in sustained over the Presbyterian Church as we look forward to September when we celebrate 30 years of being this particular church here in London. <coughs> we pray that as we rejoice that we will not make this structure or this individual body an idol, but instead we will remember to rejoice and look to the one who has brought us together the one who will sustain us and the one who will continue to sustain us. We will be able to continue to worship you and you alone. And we pray for the struggles, not that they would continue, but that we would learn from them to persevere. And that you would ultimately bring peace, whether through uh, the, cessation, the cessation of hostilities and the global struggles. bringing peace into his homes when there are uh, troubles and concerns at local levels. And we pray for our covenant children that they mature, they become adults and go out on their own, that they would live the faith that they've been given. We pray for the merciful to them and that those who love them so much trust in you for the good plan that you have. We pray for the message, not just the message that is preached in this day, but for the message that goes forth from this church that we reach southeastern Connecticut and on out to the ends of the world to bring you glory and honor. You alone are worthy of glory and honor. That we proclaim with one voice this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Testament reading this morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 8, the first 20 verses. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, Deuteronomy chapter 8. The whole commandment that I command, that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these forty years in the wilderness, that 
in my holy name, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you will keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you, and let you hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these four years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his way and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing out from the valleys and hills a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of those hills and out of whose hills you can be copper. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Blessed when you have eaten and are full, and have built good houses and live in them, and when your birds and flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, and your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions, and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, who might humble you and test you to do good in the land and speak to do good in the end. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten you as well. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God, and go after other gods, and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes perish before you, so shall you perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Our New Testament reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, verse 41, chapter 21, verse 4. says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greeting in the marketplaces. Excuse me, and love greetings from the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus looked up, and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow putting two small copper coins, and he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Good morning. Good morning. 
about a decade ago, I remember reading uh, about Google uh, and um, an article I was reading sort of referenced uh, sort of an internal motto that had, had risen up based on their internal guidelines. And the motto was, uh, don't be evil. Uh, I thought that was kind of humorous. Uh, but about, um, you know, a little less than 10 years ago, they changed that. Uh, and um, there was an interview in the New York Times in which the, the CEO came forward and explained that they were changing this sort of internal sense of don't be evil to do the right thing. Uh, and their, their motto kind of started to shift from don't be evil uh, to do the right thing, which is, I think, an improvement. Uh, and, um, but the thing that you see in this you know, particular corporation, regardless of what you think about it, is, is this internal sense that all of us have that we shouldn't be evil and we should do the right thing. Uh, that's not something that's uniquely Christian, it, and yet it, it is something that is explained uh, by the scriptures better than anywhere else. Uh, and and that, that tension of being uh, a, a person who is good uh, matters. Uh, good and evil matter. And, and as we have uh, been looking at this particular uh, sermon series, and we're looking at a variety of passages in the Gospel of Matthew, in which Matthew is um, explaining through, you know, Jesus is explaining and Matthew sort of capturing it. What is sin like? And the reason why that matters is because Jesus came to save sinners. He came to deal with sin. When, when he's named in the beginning of Matthew, when, when he says, what am I here for? It's here, I'm here to deal with sin. And, and as we approach Holy Week, as we approach Holy Week, uh, we have that opportunity to reflect on over you know a, a few weeks. What is that thing that Jesus came to deal with? We looked two weeks ago at um, Jesus bringing a child before them, reminding them what greatness was, and how God pursues lost sheep, little ones. Last week, we, uh, we also dealt with uh, the, the, the topic of, of sin from a slightly different perspective. We looked at debt and how the unmerciful servant didn't understand the debt that he was forgiven and therefore incurred a debt of mercy um, and didn't recognize what God was doing for him. This morning, we're going to be looking at a passage in Matthew 19, in which Jesus is teaching uh, a rich young woman who comes up to him and is asking him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And from this, we're going to learn a little bit about what, what Jesus really asked for. So let's pray, and then we'll look at this passage. Now, Lord, thank you that we get to come under the care of your word. Uh, I do pray that you would use this time for your purposes. I pray that you um, would open our minds and hearts, that we might think the thoughts that are your thoughts, true and good thoughts. But not only that we would have right thoughts, but that our hearts would worship you, because you are the, the God who, who saves sinners. And as we look at the topic of sin, we, we, we gain a greater appreciation of your salvation. And I pray that that would be true of each of us this morning. And in gaining an appreciation of your salvation, may we, we give you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. So Matthew 19, verses 16 to 26 is what we're looking at this morning. Again, Matthew 19, 16 to 26. And behold, a man came up to Jesus, saying, Teacher, 
what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which, which ones? And Jesus said to him, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, All these I have kept, what, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. As we uh, walk through this passage, the first thing that we, we see is we see a, an enriching teacher. Uh, a teacher who this rich young ruler sees as one who can provide excellent guidance. He sees him as a, a teacher, one who... Uh, is going to give him uh, the knowledge that he needs. Uh, and, and so you see this introduction of the, the, the ruler, the rich young man, rich young ruler's um, belief that Jesus is going to make his life richer. Uh, but then we see an impoverished student in which Jesus uh, criticizes, well, doesn't criticize, he, he challenges him. And the man goes away sorrowful. Uh, and he, he is exposed and, and grieved by Jesus' teaching. And then lastly, we see the, the, the treasuring of a good teacher in which we are reminded that, that salvation is impossible with man, but with God, all things are possible. And so we're going to look at that enriching teacher, the impoverished student, and then learning again uh, how to treasure the good teacher. So the enriching teacher. Matthew 18, verse 16, begins with this very simple statement. Behold, a man came up to Jesus, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? The teacher, I mean, the, the man's coming, and we find out from the other gospel accounts that this man, and even in this one as it unfolds, we, we find out that this man is... Uh, you know, uh, uh, an exceptionally um, gifted man. Uh, you know, as you put together the, the, the multiple accounts that the Gospels have, you, you see him as this person who is exceptionally gifted. The, you know, you call him the rich young ruler. And those, those acronyms essentially say he's got money, he's got health, and he's got power. You know, he, he really is this, this individual that is highly desirable in every culture. You know, he is, he has, in some sense, he has it all. You know, if you, um, you know, think of, of, of him approaching Jesus, he's approaching Jesus as if Jesus is going to be his life coach. You know, he's asking him, you know, Jesus, how do I, how do I, how do I learn what I need to learn? You know, how do I gain the things I need to gain from you? And, and as he's, He's, he's approaching Jesus as the teacher. We are, we, we're learning that this guy is, you know, kind of, if we sort of bring it to a modern day example, it's kind of like he's on, you know, the, the Forbes kind of 30 under 30, right? Or, you know, Fortune Magazine has the sort of 40 under 40. You know, and, and, and he is sort of the ancient Israelite version of that, where he is a high, you know, sense, sense a high profile, highly accomplished, aspirational, talented young leader who comes up to Jesus and he, you know, is approaching Jesus as this, 
excellent teacher, and he's asking him, how do I get even better? How do I live the kind of life that in the last analysis, God says, that was a great life? Well done. And he's been hearing well done, of course, from all kinds of people, because he's one of those people who almost all parents are proud of. You know, he, he has all of the credentials. He has a resume that is largely unmatched. And he comes to Jesus and he's asking Jesus, what else can I do? <laughs> what, what do I need to have the kind of life, the best life, the eternal life, timeless life? And, and again, not unlike many of us who, you know, maybe are talented and, and desire excellence. This is a man who wants excellence. You know, as I, as I read this passage over and over and over and over, getting ready for this sermon, I found myself liking this man more and more. Uh, he is, he is a, 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 an admirable kind of guy and, and incredibly persistent. And you see that as he, as he interacts with Jesus. Because So he asks Jesus, what, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says... Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. And if you uh, and if you would enter life, keep the commandments. So you got this young, talented, probably very bright individual coming to Jesus, asking him, you know, everybody's telling me you are the wisest guy around. And I think uh, as likely is the case, you are going to be able to help me understand things in ways that I've never understood them before. And he comes to him and he's seeking this great teacher, this good teacher, this one who's going to bestow wisdom on him to help him live the life that will make him envy of everyone. And Jesus tells him, keep the commandments. And he's, are you, gonna, and you, start, you can see by his reaction, he's like, Really? Like, you're not telling me anything I don't know. Uh, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that he, he, you know, being young, talented, probably, probably very bright, growing up in an ancient Jewish culture, probably knew the scriptures very well, probably could have quoted to Jesus, Ecclesiastes uh, 12, which says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth, and then ends, you know, this great wisdom with the end of the matter, all that has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, and this is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. He's looking for something profound, something new, something he hasn't heard before. Jesus tells him something that he already basically knows. You know, it's, it's kind of like you go up to somebody for great wisdom and they they essentially refer you back to the movie E.T. and they just say, be good. You know, it's like, oh, come on, you can do better than that. I know you can. You are, you are, you are the good teacher. And so he, he, you know, keep the commandments. Okay, so let's, you know, can you be specific, Jesus? <laughs> you know, general advice, vague calls to keep the commandments, Jesus. I, I'm looking, you know, in, in some sense, don't you realize, like, kind of who I am? Like, I'm kind of bright. I'm kind of a big deal. Uh, can, you, can you give me something more specific? I'm ready for something a little more challenging than just keep the commandments. I want some excellent wisdom. And so, Jesus still continues to indulge him. And uh, Jesus says, you shall not steal, or you, excuse me, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, and it's like, I know the Ten Commandments. <laughs> like, like, who doesn't know the Ten Commandments? This is child stuff. The kids know the commandments, Jesus. And he's like, okay, I know those things, I've devoted my life to doing those things. I am a person who has lived my whole life to keep the commandments, and I've been really successful at it. And 
And so he responds to Jesus, like anyone who has had immense success at keeping the commandments and living a disciplined, aspirational life that has been so filled with success that everybody in the world, everyone in your world looks up to you. You know, you go into a room and you're, you're consistently the wealthiest, smartest, most sought after person over and over and over. You start to believe. And so he says, you know, I don't, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm doing those things. In fact, that's, my, that's been my strategy for success so far. Keep the commandments. And, and again, he, he doesn't give up. He's so persistent. He, he, he doesn't go away quickly because he knows Jesus has something that he needs. He knows Jesus can add to what he knows. He knows Jesus can teach him wisdom. He knows Jesus is a life coach par excellence. There's no one better. And as he's coming up to him, you can almost feel, you know, he's saying this question, you know, all these I've kept, you know, what do I still lack? You know, you can kind of feel him. You can almost imagine, I don't know if you've had sort of young people in your life that are uniquely talented, you know, and, they're, and they know, and you've kind of had the privilege of coaching them, and, and you know the, the, the best are constantly hungering for the next thing, that can help them become even better. And you can almost feel them saying, Jesus, I can handle it. Like, stop giving me the child play stuff. Like, I'm ready for the real stuff. <laughs> like, you know, I can handle it, give it to me. You know, and it's, you know, you kind of can sort of feel it. What are the barriers to success that need to be torn down? And Jesus, Jesus lets him know. Yeah, in some sense, he kind of drops the hammer. And he says, okay, you want to know what you really lack? I'll tell you. And, and Mark, in Mark's representation of this, uh, it, it, it actually says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. It's not like he's trying to smack him down. He sees this guy and he he loves him. He's like, I, I kind of wonder if there's a little measure which he kind of likes him. He loves him. And he tells him the thing he needs to hear. But he's prepared him to this point where he, he, he's now asking the third time, Jesus, don't give it to me, strike. What do I really need? And he's told him one, Keep the commandments. Two, these are the commandments. You know the commandments. They say, like, yeah, 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 but really, what is the, what's the great new wisdom? And he says this, one thing you lack. And we see the, the student who is rich and powerful and young and healthy and has it all exposed. And Jesus shows him to be one who isn't even getting the first thing right. Because the first commandment is to have no other God before you, to not commit adultery, to make sure you're using the name of the Lord in, 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 with honor and dignity. It's worship. And he says, Jesus says to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess. Give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. He uses the same words that he uses with his disciples. Come, follow me. But the thing that it's going to cost you is your money. And he's cut to the heart. And Jesus lays him bare. And the one who seems like he has no barriers runs up against the thing that he's not willing to part with. The man goes away sorrowful. He, he laments, but he leaves. And of course, 
person feels sorrow because they feel like they lost something. You don't feel sorrow unless you feel like you lost something. And so Jesus here knows that he has an affection for Jesus. The rich young man has a high view of Jesus. He just has a higher view of his money. And that becomes the barrier that he can't tear down. And his issue is that he isn't keeping the first commandment, which is to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And not to have any rivals. And the rich young man realizes that he has a rival. And money is just one of those things. And again, this is not a, this is not a teaching saying that you know the way to righteousness is to sell all of your things any more than the way to righteousness is to gouge out your eye or cut off your arm. Like that's not the path to righteousness. Path to righteousness is come follow me. But if there are things that are hindering you, they need to go away. And what we learn from this passage is that there are things that, that from a heart level become rivals to the God who has no rival. And whenever a created thing becomes a rival to the God who has no rivals, it's idolatry. Because we're we're giving divine attribute to a created thing. Anytime you give a divine attribute to a created thing, it's idolatry. And what, what Jesus is teaching him here, through his patient dialogue with him, and allowing him to ask not once, not twice, but three times, what is it I need to know? Jesus says, what you need to know is that you love your money more than me. And he knows it's true. He knows it's true because he's sad and he weeps. He's sad because he wants to love both and he can't. And he has to choose. And you always choose the thing you love most. And the nature of sin, and part of what Jesus comes to destroy as he comes to the cross, is those vain affections for things that are less than the divine God. All those subtle idolatries in which we find good created things that we give divine attribute to, and we end up worshiping them, and they end up destroying us. This rich young ruler who seems to have it all is missing out on the thing that he needs most. And before we're too hard on him, you know, uh, it's not like the disciples get it either. The disciples are, are struggling with the exact same thing. Uh, although they have left their things and followed, they still lack wisdom. And as Jesus interacts with the disciples, we see their ignorances come forth. And it says this, And Jesus said to the disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. There's some debate over what it means for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. For what it's worth, I think Jesus, you know, calls a camel over, grabs one of its hairs, and is licking it and has a needle, and he's like showing you, like, okay, I'm gonna, right? And he's like, you're gonna be able to fit this camel through this needle? No. No. No, he's, he's, he's using a metaphor that is completely ridiculous to help you realize you can't buy heaven. There's nothing more ridiculous than thinking you can purchase, whether it be with your intellect, or your power, or your money, or your status. There's nothing more foolish than thinking that you can buy heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It's easier for a square to be a circle. It can't happen. And the disciples should say, well, of course, of course that's true. And of course they say that complete opposite. They don't say, of course that's true, Jesus. They say, Jesus, then who gets in? 
you know, pen, they, they respond with, who can be saved? Because they're thinking in the same exact categories as the rich young ruler. Like, if the best among us can't do it, who can? If the guy who has the resume and the competencies and the strength and the discipline and, and the prayer life and the, you know, you list all the things that a person of great excellence has and, and you, you compare yourself to that and you're like, there's no way. I don't, I don't match up to that person. Maybe I'm better than most, but... And the disciples are feeling like, well, that's the standard. If the, if the people who are, are, are strong and smart and moral and have been entrusted with power and have status, if, if the greatest can't do it, what hope is there for us who are the least? And at this point, the rich young ruler, which he has been teaching, and the disciples who he is now teaching are beginning to get the point. Just beginning to. And he says to them, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And there's no more corrupt way of using this verse than to say, God exists for you to accomplish your agenda. It is the complete opposite of that. And so when people use this verse to say, look, you can accomplish your dreams because you can, you know, with God all things are possible. It is the complete opposite of that. What it's saying is, your dreams can be transformed. And, and God is the God who can make anything happen. And so you who don't have enough can go to a God who does. And at, at this point where you are forced to reflect upon the good teacher, the one whom the rich young ruler has approached, and he said, good teacher, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the real answer is nothing. There's nothing you can do. That's why I'm here. Disciples. You can't be rich enough. You cannot be smart enough. You cannot be moral enough. You cannot be spiritual enough. It's not up to you. But with God, all things are possible. This phrase, all things are possible, echoes that same line that the messenger from the Lord says to Sarah, way back in Genesis. When, when she thinks that the angel's giving some cruel joke, telling her in her in her 90s, she's going to have a child. She's like, oh, come on. My greatest hopes, you're telling me I'm going to have my greatest hopes when I'm 90? Stop being mean. That's cruel. It's cruel to tell somebody who has lived in grief for 70 years, longing for a child, not getting a child, and 90 years in, you tell me I'm going to have a kid? <laughs> yeah. yeah, good luck with that. And the angel rebukes her with a seriousness becoming of an angel of the Lord. And he says, why are you laughing? Don't we know what God can do? Yeah, it's impossible for man. But not with God. You know, this, this rich young ruler didn't get that. That it wasn't possible with him. But it was with God. And the disciples weren't getting it. It's impossible with you, but it's possible with God. And, and the nature of sin is trying to do what only God can do. Putting our, ourselves in God's place and then putting God in our place is, is the nature really of all sin. That's one of the ways that sin is understood rightly. And you see here, as the rich young ruler is going away sorrowful and gives an opportunity for Jesus to teach his disciples, he's reminding them, what you can't do, God is going to do. And that's the starting place. 
And as much as you want the divine wisdom that gives you that, that little advantage over your peers and you want your excellent life to accomplish your agenda on your time, in your way, God isn't here by your idols. He's here to smash them and to replace them with something far better. And you see here, as, as we're forced to reckon with the promises of God and how God works in ways that we cannot, and he accomplishes things that we cannot, and he, he gives us things that we can't earn. It's called grace, of course. A transformative, powerful grace. And it, and it reminds you, it reminds you of that prodigal son parable, which is just one of the most beautiful stories ever told. And, and, and the story is, the prodigal son wanted the father's money and not the father. And he said, give me your, give me your money, because I want to go live the best life possible. And he realizes when he buys all the things that, that he dearly wants more than his father, he finds it hollow and broken and cheap and worthless. And then having come to his senses and realizing that his father is better than all of these things combined, he goes back. And I wonder if that's what happens to the rich young ruler. I don't know, but I hope to meet him in heaven. Because you know, he wasn't ultimately rejected. He was just dejected. Jesus didn't say, be gone. Jesus said, come follow me. He wasn't yet willing. But with God, all things are possible, right? And here, you, 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 you look at this rich young ruler, and you see Jesus said in Mark, it's recording, we love this man. <laughs> you know, and, and, and for each of us, part of our being the people God wants us to be is to see our face in the rich young ruler when we see that all of us have selfish ambition. Every single one of us. And that selfish ambition makes us evil. Because we, we want other people to accomplish our goals for our purposes in our way, which is always less than what God wants for them. Always. And 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 the, the, the repentance happens when you realize that there is a God who does things we can't do. And we need him to be at work in and through us. And you see, that gives you hope. That gives you hope and strength. And then your ambitions become virtuous because you're trying to live in God's agenda. You're not trying to ramrod God into your agenda. Because when you're ramrodding God into your agenda, he says, go sell all of your things and come follow me. But when you turn that around and you say, I want to follow you, he gives you all of the things to say, use them the way I want you to. And that's what the disciples need to learn. That, that the whole reason they have been given things is for God's purposes. And the nature of sin is when you think that, that the things and power and wealth and smarts and all of the things you've been given, it doesn't matter how you use them or who you use them for, or why you're using them. And when God searches the heart, which is what ultimately matters, the heart, the intentions, God is not only concerned with what you do, he's concerned with why you're doing it and who you're doing it for. So when you get into that rich land, and you forget the one who gave you the land, and you earn that wealth, and you forget the one who gave you the power to earn the wealth, and when you see great success and you think, I have made these things great. You become evil. When you realize there's a God who does things that we cannot, and he's the one by grace that's using us, we do good. And we become good because we're in his will. And so, at the end of the day, the rich young ruler teaches us in fact, Jesus teaches us through the rich young ruler. There's nothing more valuable than the good teacher. And when he was in the presence of the good teacher, 
If he would have given up everything and gained him, it would have been a bargain. And he didn't have the sense to see it. At least not yet. My prayer, my hope, not prayer because it's already done, but my hope is that he did. Because my hope for each of us is that you see that the things that you cannot accomplish, with God all things are possible. That he can save even you. Even me. And, and he can save others who <coughs> are full of themselves too. And turn us around into worshipers of the God who can do all things. And does all things well. Lord, we know that you are concerned not only with actions, but intentions, not only with why we do things, but who we're doing them for. And you're the one that's made all things. You're the one that gives us all things. And for us to ignore you is for us to become selfish, evil people. And although outwardly we might do good deeds, we're not doing them for the right reason for, or for the right person. And we need you to, to change our hearts. And we come to you knowing that you are the God, the God who does the impossible. Impossible for us, that is. You are able to save even us. May you use us to save others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond in song with all to Jesus I surrender. 562. Let's stand and sing. <laughs> Thank you.
as we uh, prepare to come uh, to our Lord's table, we, we see the God who does uh, the impossible. We see that with God all things are possible, that he can take our place. That the things we could not accomplish, we could not clean our own sin, we could not atone for our own sin. There is not enough that can be done or earned to earn a, a place at the table. But we are reminded that although what is impossible with man is possible with God, as the body is broken and the blood is poured out, we see how God makes a way. Not a way, the way. And as you get ready, as you prepare your hearts to come to his table, you're reminded that once again, in your need, you are made rich. In your poverty, you see the wealth of Christ bestowed upon you. As you realize that you can't do it yourself, you yet again are reminded that he can. Yet again, you are reminded that the sacrifice of a perfect man, one who gave away everything, that we could have all that he has to give, is, is, is spoken to us once again. And so if you know the Jesus who gave up everything that he might bestow his spiritual blessing upon you, that he might call you his child, that you might follow him, if you know that's true, you've put your trust in Jesus, in Jesus alone. And you've, you've represented that by being part of a church that believes in him. This is our Lord's table. Please feel free to come and come boldly. If that's not true of you, we're really grateful that you're here, but please let the elements pass. This is for those who have made their faith public. So, let's pray. Lord, we do pray that you would use these common elements for your spiritual purposes as you have instituted them, as you have commanded that we do this in remembrance of you, as you have commanded that we come to you to be reminded once again of that covenant of grace. I pray that you would stir our hearts yet again, knowing that you gave up everything for us. That there was nothing you held back. And I pray that you would help us, knowing that you've given up all for us, that we might surrender everything to you, knowing that when we do, it's in better hands. Please use these common elements to accomplish your spiritual purposes. We pray this in Jesus' name. The Lord Jesus Christ, in the same night in which he was betrayed, uh, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As the bread is passed around, it will be in individual cups. Please take as your individual bread.
And Jesus also took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As the cup is passed around, the outer circle is grape juice, the inner circles are wine. Please take as your conscience leads, and please wait for everyone to be served, and we'll take the cup together. Once again, Jesus said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. Please stand as we sing the Gloria Patri. Matthew chapter 16, followed by the benediction, receive the charge. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Receive the benediction. May our triune God bless you with a renewed sense that what he has done for you is enough. And in knowing that he has done enough for you, may you offer everything that you have to him. May that be true of you this week and forever. Amen. Let's sing May the Peace of God together. Amen.